Dr. Grimberg. This is an absolute pleasure. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Boomer. I'm, I'm really pleased at the opportunity to talk with you and share some ideas and insights with your audience. Well, when I started delving into the world of nicotine, it's very hard to get into that world scientifically without stumbling across your name. And so I, I'm honored to have you here today, but I, it just begs the question, how did you get so interested in nicotine and end up doing quite a lot of research on it? Well, that's, that's very kind of you and your comments are generous, but well, it's kind of a funny story actually. When I was growing up, I was a, a serious musician, a drummer, and growing up in the 1960s, and I was a precocious drummer. And I mentioned that not to brag, but because I was both, um, I had the opportunity and pleasure of playing in all sorts of bands with people who were older. I mentioned that because I watched friend after friend start using various drugs, say that the drug was expanding their mind, but then couldn't stop and one after another destroy themselves. So mm -hmm. it puzzled me and I was too young to try, but the drugs and I was interested. <clears throat> when I went to college, I was at Stanford University. I was studying both biology and psychology. I was studying genetics. And I also was studying, uh, working in the Stanford Hypnotic Research Laboratory. Mm -hmm. Again, I was interested in how does something, whether it's oneself or, or a drug, manipulate or altered states of consciousness or understanding of music or art and the like. From there, I went on to Columbia University and uh, to earn PhDs in uh, physiological psychology and social psychology and pharmacology. But to your story, I actually, when I went to Columbia, I expressed to my mentor, uh, a famous psychologist named Stanley Schachter, that I wanted to study real drugs, <laughs> drugs of addiction, like mm -hmm. heroin and, and mind altering drugs such as LSD. Well, they weren't studying that. And uh, Professor Schachter was studying something I had no interest in, and that was cigarette smoking. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it was a difficult decision because I had to decide which mentor to work with, whether to work on the drugs that interested me or work with this great psychologist. And then I thought, fortunately, I had the uh, uh, wherewithal or the, uh, the, the humility to realize what did I know at 22 years old. So I started working with Professor Schachter, basically, you know, uh, metaphorically rolling my eyes. Why are we studying cigarette smoking, which my father and essentially everyone I knew adult did that mm -hmm. made them work? Well, studying with Professor Schachter, we started studying and reading about some ideas with only a couple of laboratories in the world, one in London, actually, uh, a professor, M.A.H. Russell, mm -hmm. another at UCLA, uh, Murray Jarvik, were arguing that there was something in tobacco, especially this drug nicotine, that was especially important. Mm -hmm. But what I didn't expect was then as I got more and more into the biology and the psychology of cigarette smoking and studying nicotine, I then started de deciding we needed to focus on it specifically. And in graduate school, I developed an animal model, a rat model, so I could isolate and study the drug nicotine in parallel studies to what I did in humans, not separating them. Mm -hmm. And that then ended up leading to all sorts of discoveries um, that, that my laboratory, my grad students, my research assistants and I made throughout the 1980s. That was the beginning of it. And, and then we went into several of our discoveries about nicotine and food consumption, nicotine and body weight, nicotine and hunger, nicotine and attention, nicotine and stress, nicotine alcohol interactions, and on and on and on. Wow, there, there is, this conversation could go on for hours, but in the interest of protecting your time, uh, I wanna just start to go into kind of the, the addictive aspects of, of nicotine, and maybe this is cigarette smoke in general, but you can tell me if I'm wrong here. Is nicotine addictive for everybody? And is there something special about inhaling, for instance, uh, that makes it more addictive? I know you've done some work around the neurobiology of this, so I'm very, very curious. Yeah, that's a, a terrific question. Is, and one would argue that you just asked me a multi-barreled question. So I'll, I'll I, I probably did. <laughs> so. <laughs> because, so to start with, when one smokes in tobacco products, 
the drug nicotine is the primary drug of addiction. But just to get that in perspective, when one takes an inhalation on a cigarette, one inhales not one chemical or two or a hundred, one inhales approximately 7,000 chemicals. Wow. Now that's important to start with because we need to separate the health hazards, the pathophysiologic health hazards from the addiction aspects. There are hundreds of chemicals in cigarettes, but when they're burned by pyrolysis, it multiplies roughly by a factor of 10. So that's why there's 7,000 chemicals. The drug nicotine you asked about is highly addictive, arguably the most addictive drug known in the history of the world. And when I say that, we have to consider what's called addiction liability, which is what mm -hmm. you implicitly asked me about. And that is, is everyone addicted to nicotine or not? Probably not. But the vast majority of people who are exposed to it, probably on the order of 80%, do develop an addiction. Now, just to make a comment, compare that to morphine and heroin and opiates, highly addictive drug, approximately 50% become addicted to the opiates. It's only 50. I thought it it's was approximately much It's approximately wow. 50. Now it depends on exactly, fentanyl, for example, is much different from morphine and the like. Mm -hmm. But when I look at opiates broadly, alcohol addiction liability, serious for many people, is probably on the order of 10 to 20%. So if we take 80% for nicotine, 50% for opiates, 15 or 20 percent for alcohol. So to start with on your first question, no, everyone is not, does not become addicted, but the vast majority do. Now mm -hmm. with regard to the addiction, if you like, we could get into how and why it works, but, but again, well, let, let's, if you're okay with it, I would love to go into just sort of why it works and are, like are certain people predisposed to it? Okay, again, great questions. You, you double barreled on me again. <laughs> I love it. You also asked about inhalation. Mm -hmm. So with regard to a drug, one has to consider, again, whether we're talking about nicotine, cocaine, opiates, and on and on, various drugs of addiction. Those drugs that are addictive, basically, as, as I've argued, cross-circuit neurochemical pathways in the brain that are the basis of appetitive or appetite-based uh, uh, addictive behaviors. So the body comes to need the drug as if it's a foodstuff in the way mm -hmm. we need foods and have hungers and the like. Now, with regard to something else you mentioned that's important besides the drug itself, it's going to be the form of the drug and how or the drugs taken into the body, which you asked about smoking or root of administration. So mm -hmm. let's take that as well. That's also very important. Many people think the closer you put a drug to the brain, the more likely it's get into the brain. Well, that's not true mm. because the brain is protected by a metaphorically cellophane wrap, the blood brain barrier, mm -hmm. which protects our brain from bacteria and viruses, except in, in this particular subset of cases and keeps a lot of dirt out of our brain. Many drugs that we take into our bodies systemically to deal with um, uh, illnesses or antibiotics and the like, do not, do not cross the blood-brain barrier, so do not get into the brain. However, for something to be addictive, it must get into the brain and affect the brain. In the case of root of administration, one could take a drug by eating it, snorting it, smoking it, putting it in the body and injecting it in various ways, intravenously, intramuscularly. One can take it, you know, in other ways through a suppository and the like. Mm -hmm. But what's really important is the best or the most effective way to get a, a drug to the brain is to inhale it if that drug has a physical chemistry that allows it to cross the blood-brain barrier. Mm -hmm. So in the case of nicotine, when nicotine is inhaled, what's important is it crosses, it goes from the lungs into a particular part of the cardiovascular system. So the cardiovascular system has basically two circuits. One's called the systemic and the other pulmonary. So all the heart pumps bloods, of course, to our limbs and throughout our body. There is another circuit that 
that actually moves blood from our lungs. And the reason is oxygen needs to get to the brain directly. The reason it's important is nicotine, and it's true of cocaine and opiates if they're in certain forms. If they're smoked, if they're smoked, they pass into the pulmonary circuit, the cardiovascular system, and they get to the brain in less than 10 seconds without being broken down or metabolized. Wow. If the drug, however, is mainlined or IV administration, it goes to the heart, then it goes through the systemic parts of the body, metabolized in the liver, recirculated before it gets to the brain. So it's time course and it's concentration and the form it's in is different. So any drug, and this is why crack cocaine is so much more addictive than snorting cocaine. Mm -hmm. This is why, in fact, heroin can be smoked. It's called chasing the dragon. Lights up, it's put on aluminum foil and it lights up like magnesium, you know, just flares. Mm -hmm. If a drug comes that way, and that's why nicotine, when taken in this format into the lungs, immediately gets into the brain. In the brain, then, there's certain parts of the brain we could get into, particularly the ventral tegmental area and different addictive parts of the brain. Nicotine, like other drugs of addiction, similar neurobiological mechanisms, set off a cascade of release of a variety of, of chemicals, including catecholamines, most famous being dopamine, mm -hmm. epinephrine, norepinephrine, centrally peripherally, the indolamines, the most famous or well-known being serotonin, and the endogenous opioid peptides, including leucine, methionine, keflin, and dynorphin, and a, and a variety of effects. So we'll have the biological action, but addiction, as we may get into, also involves the interrelationship between psychological processes and biological. Learning mm -hmm. mechanisms, which include paired associationism, classical conditioning, and operant conditioning. All these, if you want, we can get into, or we can get into the molecular biology of how it acts in the brain. Oh, give me two very, very good choices. Uh, yeah. If you don't mind, let's go down the molecular biology route, because I think some of the paired association stuff is very, very interesting. We may get to that later, but I want to want to touch on the molecular biology a little bit. Sure, sure. So nicotine is really an interesting drug. I've actually referred to it as look up my name as the most interesting drug in the world. Yeah. And I say that because it has a high addiction liability, as I said, about 80%. But in addition, unlike any other drug that we know of in its natural form, nicotine brings you up when you're down and down when you're up. That's really interesting. It, it responds bringing one to an optimal physiological arousal. Now, mm -hmm. the way it does that is nicotine itself is a very, very small molecule. So it has a pyridine and a pyrrolidine ring, if any of your, your, your audience knows the physical chemistry of this. The small particle, then when it gets to the brain, nicotine acts at a series of receptors in the brain called nicotinic acetylcholinergic receptors. Mm -hmm. More shortly, briefly, people just say nicotine or nicotinic receptors. Mm -hmm. These receptors are very, very interesting. The molecular biology, if we really look using electron microscopy to blow them up, are pentameric structures. That means they have five units. Mm -hmm. It looks very much the way I usually describe it. If you picture a navel orange that you've peeled, segments of an orange, the nicotinic receptor looks like five segments, roughly, of navel oranges. Interesting. With, with a, you know, with the, the, what's called the navel or the hole in the middle. Mm -hmm. The molecule, the nicotine, will attach to the molecule, causing it to open a transport of certain ions or charged particles, which will then have a cascading effect on neurotransmitters. And what's also important, because you've asked about the molecular biology, and I understand that you're dealing with a very sophisticated audience, there are now identified quite a few different kinds of nicotinic receptors. Mm -hmm. The reason this is so important is from an intellectual and scholarly level, it helps us understand why nicotine has so many effects. I already briefly listed a few before. Mm -hmm. It jazzes you up, it can calm you down, it can affect your appetite, it can modulate your stress, it can affect your cognitive process, making you more alert, 
it can cause craving, it can, how can it do all these things? Mm -hmm. Well, as we now know, know, there are a variety of different nicotinic receptors. So they have different subunits of these five pieces. And we now have, we've referred to them by alpha and beta and other subunits. So certain nicotinic receptors are primarily responsible for the need, the dependence that develops, needing the drug for normal function. Mm -hmm. Now addiction or needing a drug needs to be distinguished from psychedelic effects. That's a confusion. Perhaps the most famous psychedelic drug is LSD, d diethylamine or LSD, or in John Lennon's words, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. <laughs> but LSD is not addictive. It is a profound psychedelic. It alters perception. So the addiction part is different from perceptual changes. Other nicotine receptors are responsible for its cognitive alerting effect, the fact mm -hmm. that it's a cognitive enhancer. Yeah. Other for other parts of its action. The reason I mentioned that this is beyond intellectual, you know, argument or discussion, is now, with this understanding that's developed over roughly the last thirty years, pharmaceutical companies have cleverly developing nicotine analogs, nicotine-like drugs, mm. but which can affect certain subreceptors and not others. So let's say if you have a nicotine analog, a nicotine-like drug that can turn on the cognitive enhancing that increases selective attention, sustained attention, and decreases distraction, improving cognition. This could be a phenomenal drug if it does not affect the addiction receptor, would be a great treatment to enhance cognition particularly in, in general, as well as people with cognitive problems or attentional deficit disorder mm -hmm. or with dementia. So now the developments are in various novel nicotine type drugs that may be used to treat cigarette smoking addiction, the health hazards of those thousands of chemicals, to prevent nicotine from being addicted by blocking it, and the development of novel innovative pharmaceuticals to have some of the positive enhancing effects, stress reduction, weight management, appetite management, interaction on cognitive processing. So that starts to get us more to the molecular. If you want, we could get into the, after the, the receptor, we then get into the neuroanatomy and the neurochemistry that cascades down. I, I wanna just, this is fascinating because I, I, I could definitely go down that wormhole, but I wanna, I wanna take us a little bit uh, more towards uh, just different uh, ways that people take intake nicotine. So the gums, uh, the, I have a spray over here, right? Yes. Um, when you're using those versus, let's say, uh, smoking it, I'm assuming the absorption rates are different. And yeah. I'm just kind of curious if we can go through the absorption rates and also, is there less of a chance of an addiction? as a result of using those alternatives? Terrific question. So the addiction will be, of course, as I've already mentioned, but now I'll flesh out more based on what you asked, the root of menstruation, the form of nicotine, which I, which I hadn't talked about yet, as well as the, it's the dosage of nicotine. Mm -hmm. So with regard to the ways that are most likely to be addictive, we've mentioned smoking, but it's not just smoking, it's what do you smoke? So cigarettes over the last century or so have been manipulated, created, adjusted to optimize, optimize their addiction liability. That's by changing what other chemicals are in the cigarette itself, the cigarette or tobacco column, as well as changing things such as what's called the pH or the relative acidity, because this will affect whether nicotine's in what's called a bound or a free form, Mm -hmm. and its likelihood of getting to receptors. The reason I bring that up is cigarettes are also created so that their taste, they have sweeteners and sugars and others, so that they can be deeply inhaled. And a deep mm -hmm. inhalation, as based on what I explained before, increases the likelihood the nicotine, particularly if it's in a certain chemical format, gets to the brain. In contrast, 
consider we also, people also smoke cigars. Mm -hmm. Cigars are made very differently. The majority of people who use cigars puff on cigars rather than inhale cigars. Mm -hmm. Now, people who had been heavy cigarette smokers and then switched to cigars, you will see those who inhale. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you know? It's easy by watching. If I'm watching someone smoke a cigarette or smoke a marijuana joint or smoke a cigar, if they're deeply inhaling, when they take the first inhalation, the chest goes up, and then after a couple, several seconds, a thin stream, a thin stream of smoke, but it doesn't look smoky, it looks very thin and even slightly bluish, will come out of their nose, usually. That's a deep inhalation. If someone is solely puffing, so again, picture a cigar, <coughs> pardon me, is one takes the inhalation and then soon after a big puff of smoke, looks like a cloud comes out, then the inhalation was not deep. So the various cigarettes, cigarellos, cigars, all can be smoked. And whether they're inhaled or not, and what's in them is the first answer to your question. Mm -hmm. Now we move to the other products. Many of the, some of the products you mentioned were created to ideally be used as nicotine replacement products to help with smoking cessation mm -hmm. or to satisfy the smoker again in place of smoking. Mm -hmm. Nicotine gum was the first that was developed or more accurately it's called nicotine polycrylics gum. It was developed in Sweden in the 1960s approximately. The pharmaceutical company that developed it was based on a chemist named Ove Ferno. Ferno, a Swedish chemist, really believed in some early work and some arguments that nicotine per se was important. So he started developing the drug. Other pharmaceutical companies found were not interested. Later, various documents that came out in tobacco litigation revealed the tobacco industry was well aware of the properties and power of nicotine dating back at least to the 1950s, if not wow. to the 1940s. Different story. But with the development of nicotine polycrylic scum, it was developed, it was marketed originally in Sweden and tested in Europe as a smoking cessation device. This is where we first start getting some confusion. The gum, when it came out, was very hard, didn't taste good, but mm -hmm. people who were motivated to quit smoking would use it in, in various clinical trials. When that same gum in the 1980s came to the U United States for FDA approval, ironically, the FDA did not approve, did not approve the dosage of the gum that was effective in the European clinical trials. What because was the dosage? The decision, ironically, was based on, wait, if this drug nicotine is so addictive, we better use a much lower dosage. Mm -hmm. So as a result, there was a lot of excitement in the late 80s in the United States. Ooh, this drug nicotine might work. But it ended up, the dosage of the gum used in the US was half the dosage that in Europe. And the gum purposely was poor, tasted bitter and was hard to chew. Mm -hmm. We move on because things happened with the gum over the years, but you asked about other products. Nicotine nasal spray, nicotine inhaler, nicotine lozenge, nicotine lollipops, and on and on and on. A whole variety, nicotine water, actually. All of these things were developed, especially after the 1988 report. And I don't know if your viewers will see this, but this watershed report wow. is, is very important in the history of nicotine. Because of, of the 88 report, which explained, and I'm very proud of it because I was a, a co-senior scientific editor, put together this report. And we'll link to it in the show notes for those listening. So. Okay, we, we, we can discuss it. But before the late 1980s, it was not understood, widely accepted, or even known that nicotine was addictive. Again, although the tobacco industry had decades of internal research and documents that didn't get revealed uh, until many, many decades later, based on lawsuits, pulling together all of the world literature started to understand these products. As we understood the role of nicotine in getting people to self-administer a product, cigarettes, that's deadly, 
I mean, think about how deadly it is. Um, for example, the U.S. alone. We all think of the horrors of 9-11. 9-11. Mm -hmm. Thousands of Americans killed in a terrorist attack. Each year since coming up, actually, in a couple of days, September 11th, when we think of it, we, each year we're concerned that there might be another terrorist attack. Mm -hmm. Well, cigarette smoking does not kill the same number in the U.S. as terrorist attack. In fact, let's think it's, it kills so many more, it's staggering. So in the U.S. alone, cigarette smoking is as if 9-11 occurs not once a year, not once a month, not once a week, but it's equivalent to the 9-11 tragedy happening three times a week, wow. all year round for the last 40 years. Four hundred, almost half a million Americans die of cigarette smoking, but it's not nicotine that kills them, but it's nicotine and why they're smoking and what keeps them smoking. Mm -hmm. so, so to separate all these products you mentioned are being developed, as I mentioned, ideally, to help people not smoke or get off cigarettes or substitutes. But there's also now a movement and some understanding should some of these products be developed as treatments for other things. Mm -hmm. Nicotine has shown some positive value to treat depression, perhaps yeah. to treat schizophrenia, to treat thought disorders and the like. Mm -hmm. At, at a high level, if I'm just looking at those various products, and w eventually I want to get into the benefits of nicotine. So, uh, but before that, it just so I look at those various products in terms of absorption, um, you know, smoking down to maybe even to lozenge slash buccal absorption slash um, you mentioned inhaler. Uh, what is sort of the rough absorption differences of each if you're able to? Very good question. So the absorption, if one is, if nicotine is inhaled and it's in a chemical format that does pass the, pass the blood brain barrier as it is in cigarettes, which has to be a certain what's called salt form. Mm -hmm. So nicotine itself is a viscous material, like an oily material. Mm -hmm. If it's left as that oil, it won't move across the blood brain barrier. Mm -hmm. But it's converted to what's called a salt that turns it into a solid, but a solid that is soluble in water, aqueous soluble, as well as in lipids or fats. So various salt forms of nicotine, as again, it appears in tobacco and other products. Mm -hmm. If it's in a salt form, then any inhalation, smoking, particularly powerful for, for its absorption of the brain, because of the passage and the pyrolysis, the heating, the mm -hmm. heating helps. Second would be inhalation, not heated. So for example, a nicotine inhaler, the way um, an asthmatic would take a medication or any other kind of inhaler we have for bronchial expansion or, or dilation, that would be number two. Now, after that, it's a big drop off because all of the other forms will be consumed which means they go through the GI, the gastrointestinal system, mm -hmm. get into the stomach, stomach where they'd be broken down, get into the liver broken down even more. And now it will depend again on the chemical constituent, uh, the chemical formant, as well as the pH of the medium that's carrying it, whether or not when it gets down to the kidneys, it's reabsorbed and recirculated, or whether it's leaves the body immediately. Mm -hmm. So here, for example, um, to best explain that, when, we, when humans are under stress, um, any kind of stress, so positive or negative stress, one of the effects in our body is there's an acidification of certain fluids in the body. Mm -hmm. When nicotine is in a more acidic environment in the kidneys, more of it is excreted from the body. So mm -hmm. one of the important reasons people who are addicted smoke more under stress is not because the nicotine is reducing stress, is they're losing more from the body. It's like you open the drain on your bathtub and you want to keep the water line up. So they smoke mm -hmm. more to replenish. Mm -hmm. The opposite is if one takes foodstuffs that are alkalinizers, like um, tomato juice, 
is an mm. alkalizer. Orange juice is an acidifier. Certain foodstuffs change the drug flow through the body. Again, mm. it's true of nicotine, it's true of opiates. And, and these are other important. When we take medications, you'll notice your pharmacist or physician, it's always important to say, should this food, this drug be taken with food or not? Mm -hmm. And are there certain foods to avoid or not? Mm -hmm. And that's because certain drugs are sensitive to the, the chemical constituents of the foodstuffs. So all these, the, again, inhalation heat, inhalation without heat, and then everything else. Snorting would probably be next if we used like a nasal spray. Then the next after that would be consumption, anything that we would consider swallowing or eating. Mm -hmm. and, and so intermediaries there are the spray and I guess uh, lozenge and or buccal absorption. Exactly. If the lozenge, if it's kept in buccal, like it's kept the way, um, uh, uh, like a skull bandit or something, as if it's mm -hmm. kept in the mouth a long time versus it's like a lollipop or lozenge. You know, some people chew their lozenge and swallow it right away. Yeah, exactly. But you're, abso you're absolutely right. You got the order from inhalation to, to nasal spray to buccal absorption to to GI absorption. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to go, go a little bit into the positive effects of nicotine because you, you did dabble when you're going through uh, the addiction in, in terms of giving us little teasers and yep. I, I want to double click on those teasers because <laughs> <Okay>. nicotine, <laughs> I, I do use it sort of, I don't use it every day but I do use it in certain instances and I have noticed this knock on impact of things like verbal fluency, for instance. Yes. Um, and I'm just curious if we can run through some of these positive effects of nicotine, because as you said, it's this most fascinating, most amazing drug. And I, I want to understand more about the positives. No, that, that's yeah. Or we'll call it the beneficial effects. Of the beneficial. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and I'm no, I understand. It's a very good question. To understand it currently, just a, a little bit of history. So when we go back to, you know, tobacco was was indigenous indigenous plant in North America and parts of South America. So based on the history of, of tobacco, we understand that Christopher Columbus himself wrote in his journal about Native Americans or the Indians drinking the smoke of the tobacco, okay? Now, to understand it there, because this will be relevant to your point, why? Why were they using it? Because it certainly had not been processed in the ways that tobacco industry developed processing over, you know, over you know, decades and decades. Well, some of it was used for re religious or ritualistic reasons. So if one thinks about various peace pipes, peace pipes in terms of their history, and if you look at the, anthropo the cultural anthropology, sometimes would have very, very, very high concentrations of tobacco and nicotine perhaps with some other mind altering peyote or something else. Mm -hmm. But if you think about this, we move back the centuries. If I, so let's say this works well, I, the old shaman, which I am compared to you, the young buck coming up, you want to challenge me, you know, in my, my role as a, you know, as a shaman or more colloquially, witch doctor or a chief. Before we fight, let's smoke from the pipe. So mm -hmm. what would I do? I would pack that pipe as intensely as I could because I've developed a habituation to all the nicotine. So therefore it would just jazz me up. Mm -hmm. I have you smoke the same amount and what will a high concentration of nicotine do to you to a naive body? It will throw you into spasms and convulsions lying on the ground. Mm -hmm. Just picture when I do this with you look like you're 30 years or so younger than me, you're on the ground, you're bigger, you're stronger. And I've done this now, your warriors or your supporters say, oh my God, Neil, what have you done to Boomer? I say, if you're nice to me, I'll do a dance and I'll get them back up. Right? <laughs> and knowing yeah. the time course. Mm -hmm. So I'm bringing this up because the nicotine also, when combined with others, what would it do? Well, it gave energy, it gave power, especially if one chews on tobacco, just like if one chews on a coca leaf and get a low, low concentration of what later cocaine. Mm -hmm. Let's move now forward as this is processed, we start to see, so what are some of the benefits? Well, it energizes, it stimulates. Now, why is that important? In terms of any kind of work or labor, whether it's physical labor, 
or you're a business person, or I, I believe in a previous life boomer, you did some investment work. Mm -hmm. Famously, Wall Street, or if you were on Wall Street in New York or other places, mm -hmm. you worked insanely long hours and, and you had, yes. had to be up. And as you probably know, a lot of very high powered lawyers, high powered business people, particularly in the 1980s and 90s, got very interested in one particular drug that gave them a sense of power and up, and that was cocaine. Mm -hmm. Cocaine abuse was just rampant in LA and New York and other cities and around the world for a variety of reasons. Nicotine isn't as powerful as cocaine in causing that stimulant, but it does cause a sense of alertness and energy. It also decreases appetite. So we think about this. If I want to work really long, hard hours without interruption, this drug, nicotine, in various dosage, in various forms, will make me feel more stimulated, bring me up, focus my attention, increase my ability to maintain attention, that sustained attention and vigilance, as well as select what I want, selective attention, decrease, decrease distractors that I don't want interfering with my thought, control my appetite, make me feel, bring up my mood, and then if I'm feeling bad or in the dumps, decrease my any depression, decrease any feelings of depression. So in addition now, those feelings of energy and empowerment and, and reduce depression and increase the sense of power and energy and focus cognitive ability and decrease needing to take a break to have a meal, this is incredible. Yeah. Now, take all those things I said, which are the direct effects, and those are called the, 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 the positive reinforcing effects. Mm -hmm. Nicotine also has something, this term I need to explain, called negative reinforcement. Okay. Negative does, I'm sorry about the double negatives, does not mean bad. Negative in psychology terms of behavior means the removal of something. Positive means to give something. So positive reinforcement means taking something increases a reinforcer. Negative reinforcement means removing something increases the behavior of reinforcement. Mm -hmm. The opposite is punishment. And there is something called positive punishment, hitting, hurting, and negative punishment, taking away something I prefer. A child, a child getting a timeout reduces a behavior by removing something they like. Back to nicotine. So the person who now has been exposed regularly to nicotine has started to develop a need for it. So mm -hmm. a dependence, early dependence, maybe it's not quite a deep craving, which will become addiction, biological and psychological addiction. But as the body quickly develops dependence, so you say you periodic use some nicotine products, perhaps you have some low level of yeah. dependence. If that's true, then in addition to the positive effects I mentioned, cognitive enhancement, appetite control, energy, et cetera, mood, uh, uh, raising one mood. When one is abstaining from nicotine, if you develop dependence, all the opposite happens. Okay. So you feel bummed. You feel tired. You're hungry and you're craving. You can't focus attention. So you'll notice now, if you've de once you've developed dependence, the presentation of the drug is both positively reinforcing, mm -hmm. but also negatively reinforcement. Mm -hmm. It immediately removes all the unpleasantness. It immediately removes everything that got you down. Now, if you will, exaggerating or potentiating the reinforcement. This is one of the reasons, and we've talked about it just briefly so far today, why the development of nicotine analogs in the pharmaceutical yeah. industry it has multiple values. One, of course, to help those tens of millions of people in the US and hundreds of millions worldwide who are still using the deadly drugs, you know, get deadly exposure to cigarettes in their, in their mm -hmm. various noxious states. But in addition, if one can develop a nicotine analog that has all these other positive effects and either is zero dependence or really minimal dependence, now you have an appetite control, a cognitive enhancer, a mood enhancer, you know, a focused attention, 
something that might even help with dealing with stress mm -hmm. alleviator. We have uh, substantial important areas where this drug can really uh, uh, add to the uh, to the to the availability of pharmaceuticals that can do a lot of positive things. Do you think it's an analog per se that can do that, or could you get that with? Uh let's say low dose nicotine over a spread out period. So it's that, not that, that, Now I have to tell you that that's a superb, you've all asked all your questions, Boomer have been good. That's a superb question. And I don't know the answer to that. There's been speculation. I'm trying to think, I don't know of, I can, I can speculate. I don't know of any definitive evidence that would speak to it, but I can give you one piece of evidence why I think the extremely low dose would do some, but not others. Mm -hmm. And that is, we all, we know that what are called boli or bolus infusions of nicotine are important to get various peaks. So if we were to measure blood levels or plasma levels of nicotine, it's the rapid boli, the ups and downs that appear to be necessary for some of the most marked positive effects of nicotine. However, there certainly is speculation that perhaps there's a way to get a very, very low dose. I've actually argued myself that I do believe an extremely low dose of nicotine can give some of the stimulating properties and have effects. But I have to admit readily, that's theoretically speculative. I know of no evidence. Oh, I mean, and theoretical is is fascinating to me because I, I'm a human human guinea pig in myself. Uh, but in I terms of extreme, only to an extent, I hope only to some extent. Uh, only to a certain extent. I, I I try not to hurt myself too often. Um, but when we're looking at extremely low doses, for instance, like the spray is one milligram. Is that considered an extremely low dose, or are we even looking at sub one milligram in terms of? That's low. Um, that's a low dose, especially it, it depends on what you're talking about, a nasal spray or an inhaler spray? Uh, inhaler, so just use it. Inhaler, okay, I just, that's low, um, depending on the form of nicotine, that still could be dependence producing. Okay. It okay. could be. So, so if it's a non-salt per se, uh, that would be a better choice than going with a salt as far as looking at the addiction properties. Good, just That's so correct, but, but then you, that was very, you, know, you understand it well, but then realize some of the other prop, the effects that you use that are desirable that I agree are beneficial also would not happen. See, yeah. unless it gets to the brain, it's not going to get there. <laughs> you see, so, so estimates are that five to eight milligrams of nicotine per day is the addictive range. Mm -hmm. So actually, as an example, um, decades ago, Cigarettes for a long time, all were delivering between one and one and a half milligrams in a given cigarette per day. So even one cigarette deeply inhaled, uh, uh, I'm sorry, five cigarettes or six cigarettes easily could be addictive. Mm -hmm. Then there was a period in late 1970s or 80s, lower nicotine cigarettes came out. They were running at about 0.7 milligrams, so about half. Mm -hmm. I and others studied those drugs in the 70s and 80s. And I found that many people who were smokers thinking that would be safer could get down to about seven or eight cigarettes a day. It still gave them five milligrams a day. Mm -hmm. There were then other nicotine level cigarettes dropping to 0.2 and 0.1. Some people argue that they weren't enough to satisfy the smoker. Arguments go that's because they were on the market at the same time as medium and high nicotine cigarettes were on the market. Mm -hmm. No one ever tested only low nicotine cigarettes. So arguably, I've actually argued that nicotine delivery in cigarettes should be less than 0 0.05. And the reason I've come up with that is all of the hundreds to thousands, thousands of smokers I've studied over the years, the heaviest regular smoker I ever had in a study claimed to smoke a hundred cigarettes a day that's wow. five pack. wow i didn't i didn't believe him when he told me that at first because heavy smokers smoke two or three packs until i had him in the lab mm -hmm. and this gentleman literally did what was literal chain smoking 
he literally lit each cigarette from the one in his mouth. So he never was without a cigarette from the moment he woke up, moment he went to bed. And sometimes he'd have two cigarettes in his mouth at the same time. How do you function in society? I don't know how long he lived. When I studied yeah. him, he was in his 40s. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean make that as a joke or in any way. I mean, I just don't know. I didn't follow him. I mentioned that because so if one, one assumes that that's the absolute upper limit and tough, if cigarettes were less than 0.05 milligrams, it would take 100 cigarettes to get into the addictive range. Mm -hmm. However, it would take a pack or so of cigarettes to get enough to have some of these stimulating effects. And therefore, it, it could provide some of the beneficial effects without the addiction. Making cigarette smoking, what the tobacco industry claims, totally a choice. Although currently, it's not totally a choice because it's so addictive. That I would carry over to what, what, what you've raised, is that the same types of studies, some are being done, more need to be done on these other delivery systems to determine what range, what dosage, and what amount to, to suggest to a consumer. So let's say you used an inhaler. Should you use one a day? Could you inhale 20 times a day? Mm -hmm. That type of, I don't know that details of that sort have been available. Um, again, the movement, because, you know, there's, there's such a confusion. You know, it's, it, nicotine itself to me is an absolutely fascinating drug. Yeah. It's addiction liability, however, although powerful, does not make it evil or morally bad. I do not believe that addiction is morally bad. It's a psychobiological process where the human being becomes, if you will, enslaved to the pharmaceutical agent. Mm -hmm. That said, many, many people act as if nicotine and tobacco or nicotine and cigarettes are one and the same. Yeah. Which is not true. So I agree with your line of questioning that the nicotine delivery products are very important to develop and many might have modest to substantial benefit. But then we get into the dangers of electronic cigarettes, also originally introduced as smoking cessation aids, but then unfortunately they evolved or were developed in a variety of ways that make them as or even perhaps more dangerous than cigarettes. So we're dealing with a powerful drug, but it depends on what's the container, what's the delivery system, what's the purpose. Mm -hmm. And I guess that kind of leaves me with, we have a lot of people listening to this show that come from an executive background, high performers, and, and pretty well versed, or at least have seen people experimenting with the positive effects of nicotine. Yeah. Is there a phenotype, if you will, uh, that should not touch it? I.e., you know, is there somebody listening to this that can cross nicotine off their list because they check certain boxes? Yeah, that's a terrific question. And that's very clever the way you, you framed that. So again, if we consider a phenotype and the and the genotype, perhaps some of the best research on genetic differences would then that be the genotypical differences on nicotine has been done by uh, Professor Rachel Tyndale at uh, University of Toronto, I believe she still is. And Dr. Tyndale has really examined with some of her colleagues and learned that people differentiate in terms of their speed of metabolism of nicotine. Now, this is very important and something I think we're gonna see more of in the next decade is our pharmacogenomics, how our body handle pharmaceuticals should powerfully, I think should be part of our, informa our medical information Absolutely. that would help develop what drugs we take. Something I've argued to the FDA and to others. But with regard to your question, the, ge the genotype would show up at the, at the phenotype. So mm, let me use this, this parallel. In the same way as different individuals, largely genotype, but also related to other genetic and in fact racial differences has to do with metabolism of alcohol and whether or not alcohol metabolism, which is in several steps, stalls at the first step, which causes something called the alcohol flush. Mm 
-hmm. So for example, in general, the genes, the genes have changed. We have difference from Asians, uh, other parts of Europe, yeah. uh, Western Europe. Even there's been argue if you take different um, cultural uh, subgroups. Why, for example, do um, people of Ashkenazi Jewish heritage, which I am, tend to be less likely to drink alcohol? People perhaps of Irish or other heritage can drink more. Well, it ends up there are metabolic differences, and I'm not looking to generalize across these ethnic groups, mm -hmm. but to reveal there are many individual differences within as well as between. Well, we're learning that similarly, alcohol is the most studied of that. Same is true with nicotine. So if you're a fast or a slow metabolizer, this could affect, I mean, you, you can see it can break either way. So yeah. let's say you're a very fast nicotine metabolizer. If I'm a fast nicotine metabolizer, great, that would suggest if it burns out of my body quicker, I'd less likely to get dependent. However, if I'm a fast metabolizer and I'm even slightly dependent, would I need more or less? I would need more. Mm -hmm. If I'm a very, you see where I'm going, very slow metabolizer, that'd be the genetic revealing phenotypically, I might need much less to get the benefit or the, what I wanted from smoking, and so mm -hmm. actually, even though there'd be a lot more in the system, maybe I'd only need to smoke a few cigarettes a day or these other alternative forms. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the phenotype, which would go along with the genotype, it's not as if there are personality differences. Man, decades ago, there was an argument that extroverts were more likely to smoke than introverts. I, I was actually just going to ask this question. Sure. Extroverts are dopamine-driven people. Yeah, it ends up, well, that's, a, yeah, that's an interesting issue. The extroversion and introversion argument was actually uh, uh, proposed by um, um, Hans Eysenck, a professor at University of London back in the 1960s, just because there was a correlation with people who would go to parties and the like. Mm -hmm. But nothing has stood up in terms of personality differences. Now, you've gone to a deeper question. Whether or not, though, people, okay, so there, there is an underlying relationship between arousal and how we respond. Mm -hmm. That has been described by something called the yerkes dodson function. Now, in my opinion, the yerkes dodson function is the only true law of psychology. And I distinguish, there's concepts, a thesis, little concepts, hypotheses or hypotheses. Many hypotheses confirm become a thesis. Confirmation of theses becomes a theory. Confirmation of theory becomes a law. Mm -hmm. Even Darwin's theory of evolution, you'll notice, is a theory. It's not a law. Mm -hmm. Only individual scientist who has more than one law attributed to his name is Sir Isaac Newton, who has three laws of movement and one could argue of gravity. The yerkes C. Dotson relationship, which was established by psychologists in 1908, argues that there's an inverted U-shaped relationship, like that, between arousal or stress and performance. Mm -hmm. And the performance can be behavioral or emotional or hedonic. So if you think about it, if we're not aroused at all, you're asleep, you don't care, you zero motivation, you do a pretty crappy job, you don't do well, and you don't feel pretty good. But there's a sweet spot. When we're kind of jazzed up and ready to go, that's when we do our best. But if we're super jazzed up, our performance deteriorates. Now that general curve, although existence for all people, either shifts right or left, depending on the individual, mm -hmm. or flattens or not, depending on personality and training. So for example, I work in military medicine. We, and we select, we train our doctors under stress to not deteriorate their function under huge stress so that they're ready for emergency rooms and it's critical. We select Navy SEALs and Rangers and special ops and other people doing high risk high performance, high stress jobs in a way that they don't deteriorate until it gets in you know, almost beyond stress. So mm -hmm. now we get back to your point. Are there individual differences in the Yorkie Dotson? Absolutely. Therefore, because of that, the person who needs a lot of arousal to reach your peak, and perhaps Boomer, you're one of those, or you may need a moderate amount, whether you need more caffeine, or whether you need more nicotine, mm -hmm. or 
whether you need um, something that would psychologically jazz you up. Uh, you know, I can't see what you're looking at besides the monitor now, but whether you need pictures, do you need Hardly, pictures yeah. in, right, of something? Do you need to go on a roller coaster? Or do, you, <laughs> or, or, or do you prefer on vacation to go to the mountains or the beach? Personally, I'm somebody who's so up all the time that I need to bring myself down. Mm -hmm. So I, I love going to the mountains, both because of the tranquility and frankly, the thinner oxygen. I actually think clearer if I take a hot bath or I'm at a high altitude. Oh, you can get into a hypoxia discussion too. <laughs> it, 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 exactly, and it's relevant. Other people, my wife, for example, is a lawyer, super lawyer and very calm. She needs to get herself jazzed up to work. She's otherwise, she's always calm. Mm -hmm. Like I mentioned this because here's the phenotype you were asking about. Where are you? You're a really jazzed up person. Well, will you use the nicotine to calm you down? Marriage and I mentioned it brings you down, but might it be a pretty high dose? Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you're very relaxed and need to be boosted with a very small amount, and a small amount of the drug would be less dangerous. So mm -hmm. sorry for the convoluted answer. I hope no, it's fantastic. <laughs> know that you're kind, they're, they're very kind. Uh, Dr. Grumberg, I want to be cognizant of your time because yes. I know, um, and I, I just want to kind of round off because look, I, I could talk to you for hours, uh, but I want to round off with something you said earlier about one of your first interests before you started studying nicotine was other drugs like psychedelics. And I'm just kind of curious if you're willing to pontificate about it. Sure. What do you think about what's going on, particularly in the US right now with things like MAPS and psychedelic assisted therapy? Uh, that's a really good question. Actually, I've, I've lectured on this as well. So uh, briefly, when we look at the history of psychedelics, I won't go into it heavily. Uh, as you may know, or this audience may know, you know, Sigmund Freud and others actually believed that they could be used in very psychotic cases. When uh, and Hoffman, who was the chemist who originally developed LSD, Hoffman actually developed it to treat psychosis. And then Freud argued that cocaine and then other some of psychedelics could be used for uh, epiphanies and intellectual breakthroughs. Waxed and waned for a variety of reasons, you know, and I think you're in um, Amsterdam, I believe. Yeah. First time I was in Amsterdam, which in the, let's see what year, 1970, 71, you know, it was a place that, you know, that obviously was, was quite different about how openly people use particularly marijuana versus in the US, you know, we had different mm -hmm. views. There has been though a resurgence in the last five to 10 years, particularly potentially using some psychedelics to treat PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm -hmm. um, also some other mental health cases. I believe this research is valuable and worthwhile and should be pursued. But to add to that, I also believe that there are other fascinating drugs that should be pursued under carefully studied conditions. The one in particular um, uh, is PCP, for example, fencyclidine. Oh, wow. So PCP, fascinating drug, originally, and one of its street names in the original was Elvin Tranquilizer. Now think about it when I talked about the Yerky Dotson. Yeah. Because PCP was an animal tranquilizer, huh? Knocks you out. Well, that's very high doses, very big animals. PCP, however, in the 1980s, 90s, et cetera, became known as a wildly dangerous drug, wildly dangerous drug, giving people, quote, superhuman strength. A guy, I'm small, I'm five foot six, a guy my size being able to fight off six, eight guys, you know, larger than me. Mm -hmm. Guy my size reportedly, anecdotally being able to turn over a car, okay? Wow. There, I've dealt enough with PCP, uh, with people who have dealt with PCP, with law enforcement, when I've lectured to law enforcement, uh, people over the decades about it. The reason I'm bringing up PCP, scientists are not allowed to study PCP. That was stopped many years ago. Mm -hmm. But a variety of people, including myself, say, wait a minute. What is it in this drug that gives a huge superhuman strength? Therefore, is there a potential to isolate that effect to deal with very serious degenerative musculoskeletal problems, to deal with um, multiple sclerosis or others, yeah. you see? So in my mind, 
any and all of the drugs that we've, you and I have referred to and many more are worthy of investigation because they may have a tremendous benefit. Could they be used, again, as my older friends said back in the 60s, in a more careful and controlled way to give um, spiritual insights, mm -hmm. to uh, enhance um, artistic vision? Again, you know, we go back to the, you know, to the late, great John Lennon, you know, and, and what's so interesting about LSD or Lucy and Sky with Diamonds, reportedly, if one follows the words, the lyrics that Lennon put to that song, and they're bizarre, you know, picture yourself yeah. on a boat on a river, et cetera. Some people have interpreted and argued, unfortunately, we can't ask Lennon to affirm it or not, that it was the music he played, those were the images he got because LSD caused something called synesthesia. Yeah. Now, synesthesia, you seem familiar, is a fascinating phenomenon where one perceives in a sense through a set, one of the senses that's not the one that was obviously stimulated mm -hmm. we see sound sound makes us see uh taste makes us hear auditory stimulate makes us you know uh, um you know makes us see and, and on and on and on how does synesthesia work there are a subset of people very small that actually experience synesthesia mm -hmm. they're not well treated today so long story to yours i Part of my personal philosophy is, is, well, is, you know, I'll quote Socrates, the unexamined life is not worth living. Yeah. And that we both have the blessing and the responsibility as well as the opportunities, if we have them, to explore in order to work and seek to improve the human condition. We should seek wherever it is, whether it's in Western medicine, Eastern medicine, whether it's in, in, in uh, uh, plants and chemicals that appeared in the Amazon jungle, of which there's countless, mm -hmm. or whether it's in synthetic drugs, as we understand the complexity of the brain, you know. If there are ways to then use these, these drugs as medications to help people cope with horrific, horrific, uh, 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 limited lives because of mental health problems, yeah. it should be explored. Mm -hmm. And go further, if it's a way to make life more enriching, but in a way that doesn't destroy, I believe it should be explored. But that's a personal philosophy in no way affiliated with my university of or any institution I work with. <laughs> of course. Well, Dr. Greenberg, this has been an absolute pleasure. If you have time, I just want to ask one, one quick question. <laughs> the time is yours. You're, you're a delight. You're a, you're a great host. Uh, well, then I, I want to just go into my final rapid fire questions. Okay. If you will. What excites you most about the health world right now? What excites me most about the health world is that with the seriousness of the pandemic, I'm hoping that many people at a large scale globally will come to appreciate the importance of health, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual health. And that we can, and that we all recognize the importance of spending more time to find the balance of this multi-dimensional aspect of health. That's that's the most exciting part. The other part, probably in terms of innovations, is something I mentioned before: pharmacogenomics, mm -hmm. custom tailoring medications based on our genetic differences in which our individual genetic differences are much greater than those that appear phenotypically based on race or ethnicity. What's the book that has most significantly impacted your life? Eugene Harrigal, actually a Dutch author, uh, Zen and the Art of Archery. What's your top trick for enhancing focus? I, I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. Top, top trick for enhancing focus. Oh, uh, for personally or for others? For for you. I mean, I actually, given some of the, your the people that you work with, I would love to hear the others one too. Well, I, that uh, okay. High altitude, both in terms of less oxygen as well as the magnificence and grandness of nature, mm -hmm. and 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 to realize that ourselves and our problems are issues that they're grains of sand. So mm -hmm. that to me is what gives me the greatest perspective. 
And where can people find out more about you? And your uh, if, well, if one is interested, but that's probably boring. One can simply Google my name and look at my websites or my work or I've, you know, I've had the, the privilege of I've published about 200 papers, many on nicotine, others on traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress. And the last, the chapter of my career now for the last five years, my team and I are focusing on the enhancement of leadership and followership for healthcare teams and for people in general, trying to pull all these pieces together. And that's probably um, uh, the most rewarding and challenging part of my career, how to help people relate to each other more effectively. Beautiful, beautiful. Dr. Greenberg, this has been, wow, this is such a pleasure. I would love to just continue the conversation, but thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Boomer. And again, congratulations on your interesting and important podcast. I hope to meet you in person someday. We're going to make it happen. To all the superhumans listening out there, have an epic day.